We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you see me well? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. okay. Just change the video. So I am really sorry. There have been some technical glitches, but I think that we are all used to it. This is a new way of beginning uh, uh, each meeting now. So with a few minutes late, I am very happy to welcome you to this session today. Um, my name is, let me just try to put my screen correctly because now it's my computer that is fighting me. Here it goes, it's working. Um, so my name is Elise Lassu. I am a researcher at the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, and uh, I am very happy to be welcoming all of you for this uh, open forum session on um, uh, the human rights impact assessment of artificial intelligence. Um, so I am very happy because I am joined today with great experts that have dedicated time uh, and effort in researching this topic from different angles. Um, and I am also very happy because this is a topic that is crucial in order to ensure that artificial intelligence system or related technologies are used safely from a fundamental rights perspective for all individuals. And yet is a topic that is still under discussion, that still presents a lot of complexity, and that is not uh, enough um, discussed at national and international levels. So what we've seen uh, for the past decades is indeed international organizations and public authorities and experts from the academic field, from civil society organizations that are calling for um, human rights impact assessments. Uh, Yet that's not simple because compliance with fundamental rights cannot be automated. It cannot be hard coded into computer software. So on one side, there is a need to ensure that AI is safe for everybody. But on the other side, the multiplicity of AI system and the multiplicity of uh, technologies complexify the design of effective impact assessment. At the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, we conducted uh, interviews with around 100 public and private sectors in 2019. And when we asked uh, uh, users about prior testing, the vast majority of respondents refer to either technical prior testing or to data protection impact assessment. But fundamental rights potential impact assessment were rarely addressed. So what we see is that there is a lack of understanding on how this uh, human rights impact assessment can be developed, but also a lack of awareness from both individuals and developers on the potential impact of uh, artificial intelligence systems on individuals. But thankfully, with us today, we have experts that will be able to enlighten us on these very complex questions. So it is my pleasure to uh, welcome with us today Kay. Kay is a digital rights researcher that works at the intersection of human rights and technologies, often working and serving with the most vulnerable members of Myanmar society. She has worked with uh, journalists, digital rights activists, human rights defenders, civil society organizations. We have also with us today Emil lindblad Kernel. Emil is an advisor of the Human Rights and Business Department at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. 
Emil leads the department's priority on digital technologies and human rights. He also has experience working directly with companies within the department's responsible value chain program on the human rights due diligence efforts. And he also worked on other projects that focus on the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. Uh, importantly for our discussion today, as part of his role, he has conducted a human rights impact assessment and he provided other human rights adv advisory services. I also have the pleasure to welcome Lorna McGregor. Lorna is a professor of international human rights law and PI. She is the director of the ECRC Human Rights, Big Data and Technology Project at the University of Essex. She is a co-chair of the International Law Association Study Group on Individual Responsibility under International Law. She has previously held position, um, the position of Commissioner of the Equality and Human in, in the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission in the UK. Apologies, and she is a trustee of the Iris Centre. Her current research focuses on data analytics and new and emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence and human rights. Last but not least, uh, we have the pleasure to welcome Alessandro Montelero. Alessandro is Associate Professor of Private Law and Law and Technology at the Polytechnic University of Turin. He is a Council of the European uh, Scientific Scientific expert on AI, on data protection and human rights in the uh, ADA Committee on Artificial Intelli uh, Intelligence, a CAHI committee, in the Convention 108 at the Council of Europe. He has served as an expert on data regulation for several national and international organizations, including the United Nations, the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, the European Commission, the American Chamber of Commerce in Italy, the Italian Ministry of Justice, and the Italian Communication Authority. Finally, Alessandro is Associate Editor of the Computer Law and Security Review, and he is a member of the Editorial Board and European Data Protection Law Review. Before we begin, uh, one point with regard to the structure of our discussion today. I will ask each of our speakers some questions so that we can set the discussion and we can identify what are the, the challenges uh, for human rights impact assessment of AI systems. But I would like to invite you to put questions in the chat. This is an opportunity for you to uh, point out what are the challenges based on your expertise and your experiences. And we are very much looking forward uh, hearing from you and discussing this topic with, with our expert today. So my first question will go to you, Kay. Um, this has been demonstrated by an increasing number of cases that the use of artificial intelligence can have direct and yet unknown impact on individuals. In cases where public authorities and the citizens are in conflict, are in confrontation, the use of AI-based of surveillance tools can directly interfere with individuals' rights and freedoms. From a rights holder perspective, could you give us some example of the implementation of said technologies that have resulted of violations of rights and freedoms for individuals? I would be very interested to learn, based on your experiences in your work as a digital rights activist, the types of AI system that have resulted in interferences with individuals' rights and freedom. So the floor is yours, Kay. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me as well. This is my my first IGF, so I'm so happy to be here. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to mention that um, today is actually the silent strike in Myanmar for the lives that we have lost since the coup in um, February. Um, thanks for all of your um, question. Everything, all of the you know good questions. I'll make sure that I cover all of that in um, in a short period of time. So when we talk about you know these um, AI based technologies, it is often um, marked behind the narrative of um, developing a community or a city. 
with this, I'm going to give an example such as, you know, the smart city. And when we talk about smart city, there are technologies, you know, like from GPS based waste management, traffic control, smart building to, you know, improved uh, street lighting and other general city improvements. But of all of the AI and database, you know, projects, CCTV with facial recognition is part of the main conversation as well. So when we talk about the AI systems, it is also important to take the context and how the countries operate um, into consideration, especially when it comes to the government and the authority state. Um, what we are seeing in Myanmar is not only you know, the violation of an individual's rights and freedom, but rather the whole population's um, rights and uh, freedoms are violated. And I'm not trying to say that privacy is respected um, under the you know, former NLD government, but the severity of the violation is really uh, immeasurable since the coup. Um, you know, when it comes to like um, AI power CCTVs, the concern that we have and we are seeing on the ground is the restriction on you know, freedom of expression, freedom of movement and freedom of assembly. Um, so the CCTV, you know, with or without facial recognition systems are being used uh, mainly to target the pro-democracy activists who have been, you know, organizing peaceful protests and most vocal about the um, military coup group since uh, February. And I mean, you know, when we talk about the AI systems and surveillance technology, this is not just like an issue in countries like Myanmar. So in, for example, in US, the authorities have used facial recognition to track down blood like matter, you know, um, activists in 2020, we have seen that. And the point I'm trying to make here is how the violation happens, whether it is a developed country or a developing country. So the country's values and principles towards human rights really matter. And the level of severity is different. Um, and people, you know, sometimes uh, I will come across people simply say it's a matter of adding a data protection law or, you know, including, um, you know, like legal frameworks to protect citizens. And it is not that simple in the majority of the world where these um, laws and legislation are, you know, either absent or not implemented as they are supposed to be. So context really matters and how a country mat like operates also matter. And these should be considered before there is any push for AI driven um, or, or, you know, like surveillance um, infrastructure. Uh, for example, in Myanmar, people are losing their loved ones overnight. And, you know, for, at the safest, um, the pro-democracy activists, journalists and the human rights defenders could face at least 10 to 60 years of um, imprisonment. So just going back to um, AI and surveillance technology, there are a lot of, you know, surveillance technology that already exists, such as, you know, interception system and facial recognition, you know, CCTVs. And um, when we think about what can the individuals do, um, we can only stand up for the rights to privacy and demand the authorities not to deploy you know, intrusive technologies that will exist in our daily lives. Um, but just to really, um, you know, do shout out as well. So together with Article 19, the organization that I am, you know, uh, presenting on behalf here, Digital Rights Collective, we will be publishing the Smart City research that we focus on the, um, the you know, the technology that we are seeing on the ground, um, mainly focusing like three major cities uh, that will be coming out early next year. So uh, please be on the uh, lookout for it. Um, and um, thank you and back to you. Thank you very much for this overview. Um, and, um, and, and for your words that really point out the fact that uh, depending on the context, uh, the the type of uh, depending on the context and depending on the type of uh, uh, survey and software that may be used, the use of AI technologies can have very large impact on all fundamental rights. Um, and on this, I would like to turn to you, Lorna, because you conducted research on the enforcement of the legal frameworks with uh, AI users. What were the main challenges that you came across that were voiced by public and private organizations in order to conduct proper impact assessment of AI systems? Do you think that there is too much focus on data protection? We've just heard from Kay 
that it's not only data protection that may be impacted, it's a wide range of fundamental rights. So from your point of view and based on your research, what are the shortcomings? Where do you see shortcomings uh, for the use of artificial intelligence? Thank you. Um, thank you so much um, for the invitation to join this really interesting panel. Um, so in the research um, that we've carried out at the Human Rights Big Data and Technology Project, um, including in partnership with the Danish Institute, um, what we see um, as the starting point is the question around what is the impact that we're actually trying to capture through impact assessments and other regulatory and governance um, initiatives. And I think it's already been highlighted by you and by Kay um, that we're only really beginning to understand the full human rights implications posed by new and emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence. Um, and so what we can understand is that they're, they're complex um, and that they are not only related to the nature of the technologies, but they're shaped by the actors, the context um, and the purpose of use. Um, and so what we know is that there is a lot of opaqueness and lack of transparency around the fact of use um, and how integration of these technologies into wider systems by public and private actors are impacting on human rights. And so what that does when we think about impact assessments, if they are tools to help us identify potential and actual um, human rights harm um, and as a as a tool in accountability and prevention of, of um, human rights violations. Um, what we then have to ask is, well, what, how can these impact assessments actually identify um, potential or actual human rights harm? And what is the expertise that we need to be able to carry out these impact assessments? Mm -hmm. And can we actually capture this full human rights impact through the types of impact assessments that already exist or are being proposed? And I think when we look at the tech ecosystem right now, we can see that many of the existing forms of impact assessments that exist in other sectors also apply um, in the tech sector. So there's not a clean slate in relation to impact assessments. So we've got ethical impact assessments, quality impact assessments, environmental privacy and DPIAs, data protection impact assessments, as you already said, um, and human rights impact assessments drawing from the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And while they're all using the term impact assessments, what we know is that they differ in legal basis and scope, whether they're mandatory or not, their purpose and their methodology. And what I would say is I don't think that we yet have an example where we can say, here's an impact assessment that really captures the full human rights impact assessment, full human rights impact of new and emerging technologies, or where we can point to um, and at a way in which these impact assessments are integrated and, and correspond to each other so that we can really see the full impact. So we've been looking at the relationship between data protection impact assessments and human rights impact assessments, and really using this as a case study to try and think um, about how these different impact assessments relate to each other and to try and understand whether they should be integrated or whether they can coexist in a more effective way to really try to capture the full human rights impact of the use of new and emerging technologies. Now, why it's important to look at um, data protection impact assessments is, is it's absolutely right that they cannot cover the full um, tech life cycle. Um, they're only about data processing. Um, but why it's important to look at their role um, is because they are required um, in legislation um, already in a number of states, including in Europe, and other states are considering um, similar forms of impact assessments when they're developing their privacy and data protection um, laws. So they are an important part of this ecosystem, but of course not comprehensive. Um, but what we um, see with DPIAs, um, these are some of our preliminary findings, is that first of all, they are supposed to cover fundamental rights and freedoms. So they are supposed to be about more than privacy. 
But what we find in our empirical research is most people we speak to think of them as a privacy tool. So about identifying what the impact on privacy um, is. Um, so they're seen as much narrower tools than in fact they are supposed to be, um, where they are supposed to look at fundamental um, human rights. Um, and in the tech ecosystem, that becomes even narrower because then there's often um, a discussion about, well, what are the salient um, harms? And so we end up very focused just on privacy or privacy, freedom of expression and discrimination, but without thinking about that full impact um, and the context in which um, different tech is used, which will likely be broader. Um, what we also find um, in some of our um, interviews is that DPIAs, people often speak about them as compliance exercises or tick box exercises. Um, and they have spoken about, well, do the teams that carry out these have this human rights expertise able to capture this full human rights impact, um, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and they often talk about the human rights team as maybe based in, an, in another um, part of an organization. So there are questions um, there about wider um, human rights expertise. Um, there's also issues that seem to come up around scale and how frequent um, DPIAs are. Are they one-time exercises or are they revisited um, over the life cycle um, of technology? Um, and so what we would, what we sort of find from this, um, just, just to finish up, is that there, there is a lot of potential to strengthen DPIAs to make them stronger in terms of what they could capture in terms of human rights. Um, but there are some um, substantive and structural um, challenges to making them more effective human rights tools. But there does seem a lot of scope to strengthen them um, so that when they are conducted, they, they maximize the impact that they're able to capture with human rights. But importantly, again, remembering that they only cover certain dimensions um, of the human rights um, ecosystem and so the will um, of the tech ecosystem. And so it's very important to think about what their relationship is to other types of human rights impact assessments um, to try and see whether there can be bridges to strengthen these relationships. Yeah, thank you very much for for pointing that out. Uh, this uh, it really echoed the research that we also conducted at the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. This this focus on data protection and non discrimination and the need to have a global overview of the impact uh, when human rights impact assessment are, are conducted. Um, and here I'd like to turn to Emil for my next question because uh, you conducted research on human rights impact assessment. Assessments. And I'd like to ask you what can be expected from companies in practical terms when it comes to human rights due diligence in relation to AI. What are the knowledge and the guidance gaps that still remain to be filled in order to ensure full respect for the full spectrum of human rights in the development and in the use of artificial intelligence? Thank you, Elise, and thank you, uh, Kay and Lorna, for setting the scene here. I think, I mean, as a first, uh, just a disclaimer to, to anyone listening to what I'm about to say is, is that the guidance that we put out uh, quite exactly a year ago on uh, human rights impact assessment of, of digital activities um, is what we called it, but of course that includes AI from our perspective, was not looking at regulation of this uh, kind of methodology, but rather looking at, at it as a methodology and a tool, uh, let's say, to um, in the human rights due diligence toolbox and really focused on sort of the UN guiding principles on business human rights and, and looking at at sort of what what is the expectations and, and actually requirements on businesses. Um, with, with the current frameworks, so not withstanding what might come out of, of some new regulations. But so uh, I think in the first question there that you asked, um, you know, what is what is it that we can expect in terms of companies when it comes to human rights, due diligence, when it relates to AI. And I think what was very um, noticeable in, in developing our guidance was that there was a lot of 
let's say demands or or movements to push companies to do these impact assessments which you know uh, very clear is framed as kind of a tool in itself you know it's something that you do uh, very clearly not this abstract process but you know you should do impact assessments but actually what we found is that in this guidance we had to produce a very long introduction uh, essentially because we really had to put this in where does this impact assessment, whichever kind you're talking about, how is that situated in relation to your ongoing processes of simply identifying whether there are risks with uh, the, the technology that you are developing? And I think, you know, uh, I think a case example is, is a really good one. I mean, of course, if you are developing facial recognition and it's meant to be used to, to identify protesters, uh, you know, perhaps you are quite aware that there might be some risks here. But but a lot of these others, uh, you know, traffic control uh, that was mentioned can probably be used in the same way. Um, also to monitor demonstrations or, or whatever it might be. But I think those developers uh, are not very mature in their general due diligence uh, requirements of, of sort of simply understanding what are the contexts that we imagine that this can be used. So also Lorna was talking about this, you know, the tech ecosystem. And I think what, what some of these impact assessment methodologies maybe miss is that they, we want developers to think about human rights, but if it's too narrow, uh, then it's like you haven't even considered how will this exactly be used? In what context? So what we then proposed in our human rights impact assessment guidance is that in order to conduct a human rights impact assessment according to our methodology, you have to decide on a context to look at because it is impossible to do, I think, almost impossible to do meaningful consultation with affected uh, stakeholders or affected rights holders if you don't if you have not decided which context are we looking at a smart city in montreal will have some issues and a smart city in yangon will have others and i think we cannot treat smart city as smart city we we have to think where is this meant to be developed and and that gave me to another point and then i'll maybe i'll stop there and also here from Alessandro before we continue on the discussion, but is that we need to also, we, another piece we spent a lot of time on was also on stakeholder engagement, where I think we also need to challenge ourselves in the human rights community to, we can all demand and we all should demand proper meaningful stakeholder engagement, but we also then need to see when that is very difficult if we want very early assessments, I think they will be naturally more abstract and they will be more difficult to do this very targeted stakeholder engagement. If we want assessments at a later stage, that might be uh, easier. So we need to think about that when we think about regulation also, at what stage should this happen? Is it only first an initial risk assessment that then can be scale to something else in case risks are identified. Maybe that's a way to go about it. But I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much. That was very concise and to the point. Uh, and uh, really adding to our, to our discussion until now. So we, we have looked at, can you hear me? I had a, a message. Yes. Okay, I see you nodding, thanks. Um, so, we have had an overview of uh, the seriousness of the impact on all fundamental rights for individuals. Um, then, you know, uh, uh, Lorna recalls that it's important not to look only into data protection and to conduct a really in-depth assessment that is not only a check checklist uh, um, exercise uh, and to cover all fundamental rights. And you're adding to the discussion the importance of the context that AI systems in one context or in another context for one purpose or another purpose are not the same and should not be assessed in the same way. Uh, and these also include um, the, the type of stakeholders that will be, depending on their expertise, will be involved uh, in, the, in the impact assessment exercise. 
So now I'm turning to uh, our, our last speaker, Alessandro, because you have worked very extensively on these specific questions, trying to solve the different issues that were raised by uh, the speakers uh, uh, until now. So based on all of the work that you conducted, what is in your view the most challenging of the criteria that should constitute a human rights impact assessment? And also, what do you think are the elements that constitute the absolute minimum criteria that any AI developer should um, take into account before launching uh, a new AI system? Alessandro, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Liz. It's a, a great pleasure to stay with you. And also, uh, it's a, a great pleasure to have this discussion of a human rights impact assessment, because as you mentioned at the beginning, it's, uh, should be at the center of the ongoing debate on AI regulation. Unfortunately, it's not so debated. Um, I think that, uh, um, as already mentioned by Emil, uh, there is not a perfect solution for human rights impact assessment. Human rights impact assessment is by nature contextual. And I can say it's even more contextual in the context of AI. Uh, because, uh, um, as uh, also mentioned by Lorna, there is a difference between uh, data protection impact assessment and uh, human rights impact assessment. This is something that uh, we have also seen in a project that uh, was an H2020 project in which we investigate a different model of uh, data protection impact assessment adopted by several uh, national data protection authorities. And in all these uh, models, there was a blank space to say, you have to check also if there is a potential impact on human rights is not exactly the idea of impact assessment. And on the other hand, there are very robust model of impact assessment. For instance, Emil and uh, its um, organization work a lot on this topic. And, uh, uh, and there are very concrete application. Um, I think the main problem is that uh, the human rights impact assessment that we are used to uh, apply to technology are in many cases uh, based on a specific kind of uh, uh, risk, uh, risk that are in many cases based in a specific area, are created by a certain kind of industry, and the impact is on population, the impact is on houses, the impact is on a society, a very contextual society. Um, on, in the context of AI, it's a bit different. Uh, for this reason, I think that we cannot uh, merely extend existing numerous impact assessment to AI, but we have to partially reconsider this model. Uh, because uh, when we talk about AI, we talk about tools that are developed at global scale and also distributed at global scale. On the other hand, many cases as smaller in terms of scale compared to uh, um, impacting industrial plan in a specific area. Uh, so uh, a new system of video surveillance, uh, a new dose uh, equipped with AI, uh, a new smart toys, uh, a new smart locker is something that of course may have many several different impacts, for instance, in the work that we carry out on uh, impact assessment, uh, human rights impact assessment and AI, we analyzed uh, a smart uh, doll equipped by uh, AI uh, um, services, uh, AI uh, abilities. But uh, um, at the same time, the impact is more limited. The doll may affect the interaction with the kids, uh, may affect the manner in which the kids learn, but is limited to the kids. Nothing about the impact that a big industrial oil plant have in a specific region. So I think this different kind of scale is also reflected in the um, main goal of human rights impact assessment. Traditional human rights impact assessment has a main goal to support policy awareness and to create a new policy in order to have a better compliance with human rights. But when, like in Artificial Intelligence Act proposal, or also in the Council of Europe proposal for the future trade on artificial intelligence, when we use human rights impact assessment to assess compliance, or to create some specific obligation related to the level of risk and the manner in which we address this risk, we need more specific tools, tools that have a sort of 
provide as a sort of quantification of risk with all the limitations that are in this quantification, of course, because uh, is, uh, is uh, not exactly a context in which we can quantify uh, um, properly when we talk about human rights. But this is something that is necessary because if we talk about high risk and there are some obligations for high risk, you have to define what is high risk and you have to, to, to assess the level of risk. The same for the legislator when the European Commission say this application of high risk, why are of high risk? Uh, which kind of assessment? It's not only a political statement or a personal feeling should be demonstrated. So I, I think that uh, the model that uh, I have uh, designed in this article that if you want, I can also share in the chat, in, in the model, try to figure out uh, the level of risk considering the likelihood, the severity. So the traditional variables that are used for risk assessment, but contextualized for AI. And as mentioned by Amy, and then uh, I close, uh, as mentioned by Amy, an important role is participation and experts, mm. because the expert by themselves cannot fully understand the context without an active interaction with the stakeholders and with the organization that in the context are potentially affected by the AI application. Uh, thank you very much. This is uh, extremely interesting. And I think that you really pointed out to two key elements. Uh, the the global nature of the of the use of AI systems that required to rethink the way human rights impact assessment are functioning until now, and the importance of being able to quantify uh, the the risk. Um, so these are two key elements. Um, we have some questions in the chat, uh, and I can see that the second question actually direct to what uh, Emil and Alessandro were saying. So. I I will uh, let you maybe have a look at the chat, think about it, and I will just begin by the first question on the chat from Alan Ochola. I hope uh, that I didn't mispronounce your name, that is directed to Lorna. And uh, Alan is asking, what model do you think can serve as best practice in artificial intelligence impact assessment? Please, Lorna. Thanks so much um, for the question. So um, I think if we were if we were imagining that we were going to start with um, a clean state, a clean slate, and we could just construct an impact assessment now um, for the tech sector, um, I think we would be thinking about um, one type of impact assessment where we could really um, think through the methodology and exactly how we could identify human rights, um, the human rights impact. Um, but I think we're not in that space. Um, so what the challenge is, is that we have to figure out how we maximize and use the existing types of impact assessments um, that we already have and how we think about the critiques of them and particularly these ideas that they are um, there are tick box, ex ticks, mm. tick box exercises, um, that there's not the participation um, or the expertise um, that Alessandro has, has just spoken about. Um, we need to think about how to really integrate those types of features into what we already have. But then I think we need to think about the bridges between them um, and um, how when we take everything that we have and if public organizations and private organizations are doing what they should be in relation to their existing obligations and responsibilities, does that get us to a place where we have sort of an effective um, ecosystem of impact assessments or do we need some new ones um, on top of that. But it's a very complex question because they all have such different features. Um, they're regulated by different actors or they're not mandatory. So we really need to try and look at that tapestry and think about how we work with what we have and then question whether we need, we need new ones. But I certainly think that it's really critical um, to be thinking around participation, to be thinking around oversight of the conducting of impact assessments the type of expertise that we need for the tech sector, which is not just technological expertise, but is the kind of context um, and understanding harm, which is, you know, other types of social science expertise. Um, but I think what cuts across all of them is regularity. Um, my 
impression is if you if you look at the UNGPs and you look at how they've been interpreted and you look at all the fantastic work by the Danish Institute, what we are thinking about is impact assessments um, regularly so that that businesses in the UNGP context are revisiting them, at the, you know, at the point when they conceptualize an activity or entering a market or designing a new product. There's an impact assessment uh, undertaken at that point in time, but then it is sort of repeated to see actually what is happening um, as, um, as the business continues in this new market or as a product develops and as it's taken to market that you have to keep revisiting to see what's happening and either stopping what you're doing or changing it depending on the human rights impact. But my impression when, when we have been carrying out research is that impact assessments, regardless of their type, are really seen as one-off things at the beginning of an activity. And so I think that that's crucial throughout all impact assessments is ensuring that they're revisited um, and that the activity that is being assessed is re-evaluated. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a crucial point that uh, we didn't uh, discuss yet, and that is absolutely fundamental. That uh, AI is a tool that is constantly changing. The um, impact that it can have on, on individuals is also constantly changing. And so there is a need not to conduct an impact assessment once before it is launched, but regularly to assess whether new impact and individuals can uh, emerge. Uh, you also talk about uh, the importance of having the right stakeholder and the right expertise coming into play. And this is a link to the question from uh, Herman Ramos that is asking who must be responsible of conducting a review and assessment of the existing data protection law in order to determine whether there is sufficient protection of human rights and private life in the context of AI systems. So. Erman is asking, should a data protection uh, authority be uh, capable of that? Should DPA have this uh, among their, their mandates or should it be other stakeholders? So maybe uh, I'd like to ask Emile and uh, Alessandro to say a few words about this. And then if there are not other questions, I would have also a question for Kay. So please, Emile, maybe first and then Alessandro. Yeah, I think very quickly. I mean, this this really goes back to discussions that I've had with Lorna and the, her colleagues in the past of why, you know, we thought it was a great idea to do this research and, and see, you know, when you read uh, the GDPR, it looks like it could be great for human rights. Uh, I don't know that we have, you know, all the information to say that it really doesn't serve that purpose very well, but it definitely seems that uh, that it doesn't. So, I mean, that's the, a piece of, of uh, trying to have that discussion. And then I think there is a discussion which maybe the DPA then should have is, uh, should the data protection regulation even aspire to, you know, do this to also cover more things or, or should it not? But I think, you know, it at least should not pretend to cover a full range of fundamental uh, rights and then not to do it. I think that's that's an important. And so I think it's a discussion to be had where I think all stakeholders uh, should be invited to respond to your question uh, and where where we should sort of pay attention. Uh, I also just to, to yeah, finally, I think this is true for now, the, the mushrooming of regulations that will, you know, the AI regulation, the CAI perhaps convention, uh, mandatory human rights due diligence, how does, is there any coherence here, data protection, uh, impact assessment requirements, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that discussion just need to be had. Then who is ultimately responsible, I'm not sure. Thanks for this. Um, Alessandro, do you want to uh, bring some further clarification? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, uh... If the question is focused on uh, on uh, data protection and uh, uh, the level of uh, uh, protection of human rights in the context of data processing, I think that uh, according to Article 35 of the GDPR, of course, data protection authorities are entitled of this power. Uh, another 
problem if these authorities has enough practice and skills and competence to do that because as mentioned in your research and in other research there is no so evidence that human rights is at the core of data protection impact assessment and moreover this works in the european union context and although in a quite uh, different manner in different countries, because we have to also remember that the protection authorities are not always the same. There are different kinds of structure, different kinds of powers, different kinds of organization, et cetera. And outside of Europe, there is not this kind of approach. Outside of Europe, there is no any reference to human rights in many data protection laws. And, and as mentioned also by Emil, another, uh, element of ASEAN 20 is the future overlapping between the AI regulation and data protection regulation. And so yes. AI authorities and data protection authorities. So I think that uh, is something that they can do, but not necessarily they have in a position to do, and we don't know in the future what it will happen. Thank you for this. You're absolutely right. And it's actually a, a perfect link to the question that I wanted to ask to uh, Kay. Uh, because, you know, we're talking about human rights impact assessment, but for specific tools that are being used for surveillance purposes, do you think that human rights impact assessment could be sufficient in order to prevent from fundamental rights violations? Uh, you, in the introduction of this, of this panel, you've been referring to very serious violations uh, in, in Myanmar for human rights activists, uh, from civil, for civil society organizations and for individuals in, in general. Do you think, uh, and linking so to, uh, as Alessandro was uh, referring to, the uh, draft AI regulation that is uh, currently also proposing the a complete ban of uh, certain use of uh, AI, do you think that um, for specific AI tools, when potential impacts on uh, individuals' rights and freedom are too important, human rights impact assessment could not solve them and they should simply be banned. So Kay, if you, if you would like to say a few words about this. Um, thank you. Um, this is also a really important question, but, but before I get into the human rights impact assessment, I just wanted to talk a bit about the data protection and uh, about the stakeholders. Um, I just have, you know, I just thought about a perfect example that I have seen um, in Myanmar. And so before the coup, you know, we had some sort of like legislation and some, you know, somewhat working um, authorities or government uh, bodies. And Telenor came into our country around 2014 after we passed the telecommunications law. Um, and I, I think um, Telenor did the human rights impact assessment. Um, I might be wrong on this, but. Um, we didn't have any data protection, you know, um, legal framework in Myanmar. But when the, for example, the authority requests the data from Telenor, they will have their own like internal um, data protection policy, for example, when it comes to dealing with, you know, police requesting data and et cetera. And that's a kind of, you know, a practice that I have seen the, how, you know, the business trying to have that kind of, um, you know, policy internally to protect um, the data of their users. But of course, you know, if the authoritarian, um, state or situation is changed you know, dramatically, um, even having that internal policy is not sufficient anymore. So going back to the you know, human rights impact assessment, whether it is sufficient, it is really important that um, it is sort of like you know, the first basic step that the enterprise, the business, or all of the other you know, stakeholder do the due diligence before implementing or like even you know testing out these kind of like technologies uh, but in terms of whether the AI technology should be banned or not I am not sure if you know I have enough knowledge to um, to say you know what should exist and what shouldn't but when we talk about these technology it is also really important that we need to demystify about the AI and you know the intrusive technologies because um, most of the time, it is also really important for the civil society to better understand the, so that they can you know advocate on these issues but what i am seeing is uh because it has been you know all wrapped around like 
you know, high tech technology and um, like the word AI itself. Um, so I feel like we really need to de demystify so that people can simply understand and not only the civil society, but, you know, a general, uh, a public, you know, a person can have a say in this, like, hey, you know, this is my rights and I have the rights to the privacy and stand up for themselves. Yes, thank you very much um, for for this clarification. Um, I, I'm also looking at the time and I see that there is also a question from uh, Veronica Stefan in relation to um, uh, to the pharmaceutical industry. So I'm, I'm just going to read that out. I've seen that, uh, Alessandro, you already put a, a very short reply, but maybe you want to clarify this. So Veronica is asking, do you imagine any future where AI technologies could be regulated such as the pharmaceutical industry. Maybe having different approaches such as medicines versus supplements, assuming that AI technologies that are identified to have a higher risk might be regulated or assessed the way we do with medicines. So this is all about this parallel between, uh, you know, the current legislation to regulate the new medicines or even medical devices and AI as we have, uh, uh, as we have seen. So maybe Alessandro and then Emil, and then uh, I see that there is a last question also for uh, Kay. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, this is a, an important uh, scenario to look at. <clears throat> in my, my forthcoming book, I have a section that is based on the experience, for instance, of uh, ethics committee in the context of uh, medicine and regulation and uh, how this experience can be also useful for AI. So in terms of our risk and the, the, the assessment in the end of experts, of course, this is an important uh, context to consider, but there are some differences. I think the first difference is that there are different, uh, it's a different technology context. In the pharma industry, we have a few players and we have a very structured context, right. hospitals, uh, clinics, uh, research center, et cetera. AI can be easily developed by every guys that have enough uh, background or access to tools and the sell to a local municipality. Uh, the second point is that in, in the pharma, do the huge amount of investment necessary? We have a few products for a very specific purpose in AI, is cheaper as a technology now, and you can have many products for very, very different purposes. And the, the point is that uh, if the pharma industry is very regulated in terms of testing phase and trials, et cetera, uh, I don't know if you can imagine to extend all this stuff to AI because there are very, very basic AI application. There are very, very risky application. So it's not so easy. And please consider that also for the pharma, the European Union had some challenges in over-regulating this uh, sector. And finally, uh, the pharma uh, product in the pharma industry is per se global in many sense, uh, while a uh, product of AI and the impact of, on human rights is very contextual because uh, the same product that is used in one context for, for instance, uh, uh, predicting policy or also tools uh, uh, mm -hmm. for education do not fit well in another context. So it's not easy because the pharma is a global product in many cases. Thank you. Thanks for this. Uh, Emil, you raised your hand. You wanted to... Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I think maybe it's a very, very quick point, but I think maybe it's lost in the updated uh, draft uh, regulation, but initially in this white paper, I think from the EU, you know, the very clearly segmented sort of uh, risk sectors, risk applications and risk um, uh, kind of country context, let's say. And I think here, I mean, uh, of course, <clears throat> AI is a technology, uh, pharma is a sector, but to think, you know, if you uh, develop any AI system for the healthcare sector, maybe there are more requirements on explaining why you don't uh, conduct certain assessments, for example. I mean, that might be a way to treat it that, yes, if you can explain that you only did an AI system for the healthcare sector to help with scheduling of appointments, perhaps, you know, then you can say, so there was no need to really uh, focus much more on this, but you know we can expect that right to health might be in the crosshairs, and therefore 
uh, maybe the tension level should go up. But yeah, just a short point. Thanks a lot for this. And so because we uh, are approaching the end of our panel, but I think that we can take a few more minutes because I had uh, some technical issues. So I will take the advantage to prolong a little bit the discussion. And I see that there is a, a last question for uh, Kay. And it's a good one because it's asking you ideally, what do you think could be expected from companies? We talk about public authorities and the role of legislation, but it is true that companies also have been developed, uh, you know, from ethical guidelines to some internal checklists uh, for in order to, to ensure that fundamental rights are protected. So, you know, in an ideal scenario, a uh, question by Ru Pereira, what do you expect from company in all of this? Thank you. Um, thank you. This is a really good um, question, and I'm going to refer it to the research that has been done by, you know, Danish Institute for Human Rights, together with a few other organizations and also Myanmar Responsible Business um, um, Organization. So I, I just drop it in the chat. Um, what we will really want, and this is not just, you know, limited to Myanmar situation, and what we will really want to see from the companies when they are entering a country is to really understand the country's context. Um, because, you know, um, the countries, all of the countries have like complex, you know, history and different uh, stakeholders. And, you know, because of the, sometimes it can be like conflict and even for the conflict, there can be like a lot of, you know, numerous uh, multi-stakeholder in it. So. I will say the first part is like to really understand the countries that they are entering. Um, and also I'm just gonna, you know, refer the IDD, ICD um, sector-wide impact assessment that has been done. Uh, what we would really want to see from the companies are also, you know, to have the kind of, uh, if there is no protection um, and if they've decided that this is worth and, you know, we will be bringing more impact by entering this uh, market in this country, then I will really, expect to see, you know, data protection, um, that really, you know, the internal policy that respect um, the user's rights and also the transparency. Um, I will say, you know, that Talino did a lot of uh, sustainability report um, every year, but we need, um, we didn't see any of those similar, you know, actions taken by other tech like companies. And even when we talk about, I know that we are talking mainly about, you know, the kind of, I've been talking about the ISB companies, but if we also look at like social media companies, even though there is like transparency report, you know, how transparent are they? Um, it is also really important to ask these questions because they will say the government had requested this number of amount, but if you walk on platform accountability and if you walk on these issues in your country, you know that the government did not just ask like to request data, you know? Um, so it is just like, when we talk about companies, we also need to look at like a broader range of um, um, companies. And um, I would really want to see, you know, them um, really respecting the transparency and also, you know, like remedy oversight and, you know, um, yeah, so that that would be, you know, something that I would really uh, want to see from from the companies. And I mean, um, I'm just going to quote everything from ICD impact uh, Y assessment. So please do uh, go there and then read it. It's a really, really um, amazing and very important uh, report indeed. Thank you. But thank you very much for this. Indeed, we have a few links and uh, references in the chat. So we all have our uh, reading for the weekend. Um, so to wrap up, uh, because a lot have been said today and, uh, you know, we will do our, our homework and we will uh, the, um, put in writing um, all of our discussions and everything that was said today, and it would be available in the IGF website. But what I take from this discussion, really the three key outputs is that there is a crucial need to move away from the focus on data protection in order to look into the, the scale of the seriousness of impact for all fundamental rights of individuals. That's the first point. The second point is that there is a need to rethink uh, traditional human rights impact assessment tools. Because of the scale of the impact of AI, we need to be able not only to qualify, but to quantify the risk in order to make human rights impact assessment um, effective support in, in uh, identifying 
assessing and preventing uh, impact on, on individuals' rights and freedoms. And finally, the key word that I think has been mentioned by all speakers today is context. The context of the use of AI is really key in order to define case-by-case case human rights impact assessment. So on this note, um, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today for your questions in the chat. And I would like to put a special thanks to our speakers that uh, have provided us with very good insights so that we can uh, reflect a bit more on how to progress on the question of the human rights impact assessment. Enjoy the rest of the ITF. I think today is the last day and have a wonderful weekend. Many thanks again to all of you. Thank you. Bye.